Hey everybody, it's Michelle with Florida Keys Birding and today we're talking about the Great Crested Flycatcher. I really love these birds. They have a lot of personality um, and they're just really cool to watch and I love their call. I do have a video of their call that I will post in the description below if you want to hear it. So this is a large assertive flycatcher with rich reddish brown accents, brownish gray head and face, a gray throat and breast, and bright lemony yellow belly. The brown upper parts are highlighted from the rufous orange flashes on the primaries and in the tail feathers. The black bill sometimes shows a bit of pale color at the base. The Great Crested Flycatcher is a common bird of the eastern woodlands. They may be common, but they aren't super friendly. The ones in my area don't seem to really like people. I don't know about where you live, but mine are very shy. And they fly off really quickly once they spot you. Its habitat is hunting high in the canopy, uh, and it's not particularly conspicuous until you t learn its very distinctive call, an emphatic rising whistle. It's almost like a whoop. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best um, impression of it. But like I said, you can hear the call in my other video. Um, so you will most likely hear this bird before you see it. And when I say hear it, I mean from very, very far away. Sometimes I can hear one all the way down my street. So these flycatchers swoop after flying insects and may crash into foliage in pursuit of leaf crawling prey. They are the only eastern flycatchers that nest in cavities and this means that if you have a nest box you could very well see baby flycatchers this summer. My neighbors had them last spring, it was super duper cute. So as far as like size and shape, um, the Great Crested Flycatcher is a large flycatcher with fairly long and lean proportions. Like many flycatchers, they have a powerful build with broad shoulders and a large head. Despite its name, this bird's crest is not especially prominent all the time. They call it a Great Crested Flycatcher, but I don't think the crest is really great compared to some other crested birds. You can't even really see it unless they raise it up and it looks more like a puff than a crest to me <laughs> but the bill is fairly wide at the base and straight and the tail is fairly long you know you can really confuse this flycatcher with many other flycatchers like Lasagra's flycatcher we had that recently at Long Key um, State Park the brown crested flycatcher uh, they they all really look similar um, so yeah you, you really can get these flycatchers confused if you're not used to seeing them so as far as behavior goes the great crested flycatcher is a sit and wait predator hanging out on high perches usually near treetops going after larger insects and returning to the same or nearby perch yeah this is pretty much what i see them do and of course their clear rising reap calls are very common in the summer and you hear I, I always call it like the sounds of summer the cicadas um, the gray kingbirds the great crested flycatchers I'll do a video one day on the sounds of summer for me um, yeah I guess it more it, it is more like a reap than a whoop I don't know I don't know why I I keep I feel like it makes like a whoop sound but that's just me <laughs> anyway so the food that it likes to eat um, the great crested flycatcher likes to eat mainly insects of course hence the name flycatcher and other invertebrates as well as small berries and other fruits I have seen them eating berries fig berries yep I'm gonna talk about it again strangler fig berries I have seen them eating gumbo limbo berries I've actually seen them eating a lot of different kind of berries so th this I have witnessed myself um, so they eat butterflies and moths beetles grasshoppers and crickets bugs bees wasps flies other insects and spiders I'm not super excited about them eating my butterflies <laughs> I don't really want them to eat my butterflies okay but yeah you know they gotta eat they gotta eat so it is what it is so they usually take uh, their prey from the air um, the surface levels of leaves branches off the ground from haystacks and bark crevices or from crannies and such human-made structures such as fence posts or rails 
plant food includes whole small berries, um, the pits of which are regurgitated after the berries are eaten whole. I didn't know that. I can't say I've seen them do this, but that's what it says they do. Dragonflies, moss, and butterflies are offered to chicks whole, wings and all. But if they're rejected, this is interesting, the parents crush the insects and re-offer them. That's kind of funny. Like when you try to give your kids something that they don't like and then you try to offer it again to them like in, a, in, another, in another way, in another form, so it kind of tricks them into eating it. So I guess we're not the only parents that do that, right? So that's pretty interesting. So the habitat for the great crested flycatcher is um, they prefer breeding territories in open broadleaf or mixed woodlands and at the edges of clearings rather than dense forests. They avoid the northern coniferous boreal forest of Canada. So they avoid th those areas. And among woodlands, they favor edge habitats in second growth forests, wooded edge um, wooded hedge growths, wooded hedge rows, not hedge growths. <laughs> Can't talk today. Isolated woody patches and selectively cut forests over continuous closed canopy forests. Dead snags and dying trees are important sources of the cavities that they need for nesting. This is do. I, this is where I do find them. I find them um, on forest edges. I find them on you know edges of. Um, you know, hardwood, tropical hardwood hammocks, snags, stuff like that. Um, I don't know if I find them in mangrovey areas. I'd have to think about it. I mostly find, yeah, 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 I do. I, I see them in like the super tall black mangrove areas down here. Yeah, because remember our habitat is different. So usually when they'll list a habitat, it usually lists like an up north type habitat, but Florida's a little different for us. So yeah, that's where I usually see them down here in the Keys and in South Florida. Um, I do see them in the Everglades as well. So, um, so they do, um, tolerate human presence and will search out cavities in old orchards and in woody urban areas like parks cemeteries and golf courses that's got to be somewhere else because they don't like human stuff here they don't really like i don't know they don't like people I, they don't they really don't um if they see me coming up on them they're out they're out of here they're usually not sticking around i'll tell you that um maybe in other areas maybe because we're not very densely populated they're not used to people so if there's enough trees they will claim territories and pastures along streams and rivers and in swamps and wetlands on their wintering grounds they extend their tolerance of wooded habitats to shrubby clearings clearings with scattered trees and semi-arid forests okay so yeah that makes sense you know for for down here um, even though we do have them year round, but I, we definitely see more of them in the winter time. So as far as behavior goes, the great crested flycatchers hunt from perches and treetops. Like we said, they'll be up on a, on a snag high in the air, peering in all directions with a characteristic bobbing head. This is how I see them most often. They're very swift and agile flyers and persistent in chasing flying prey. A first miss doesn't end the chase. And if they've spotted prey sitting on leaf tops, a twig, tree trunk, or a head of weeds, they swoop down from their perch and then break abruptly to hover just low enough to snatch the prey and fly off. Wow, that's pretty impressive. So sometimes the breaking is minimal and they crash into foliage with a little slowing to snap up the prey before continuing along their flight path. So it sounds like they have a lot of control of how they fly. It's like <laughs> it's very um, distinct and very, very well controlled. And so they'll drop down to take prey on the ground too and males swoop down at females from high perches to solicit mating. If the female retreats into a cavity, he hovers before returning to a perch and repeating the maneuver for another try. He guards his mate particularly during nest building and egg laying. Intruding neighbors are never ignored. If calls don't dissuade the intruder, a raised crest, a forward leaning posture accompanied by a nodding and pumping head, a snap bill and rapid chase may follow. If still undeterred, the f 
Intruder faces attack. Grappling and pulling feathers. Oh my lord. I definitely haven't seen that, but that's got to be interesting to watch. Um, so eggs uh, are sometimes uh, incubated by the females, are vulnerable to predation by snakes. Squirrels are often will often raid nests. In spite of their preference for edge habitats, great crested flycatchers are only infrequently parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds, probably both because they nest in cavities and because they're very aggressive towards intruders. So let's talk a little bit about nesting. Um, like I said, they'll nest in cavities, and this is where I saw them nest in my neighbor's nest box for the first time. It was very interesting to see, and I didn't know this until I observed this myself. It was really cool. Last spring, I got to see that. I kind of want to put up nest boxes in my yard in hopes that I get a nesting one for this year. That would be pretty awesome. So they favor natural cavities and dead trees. They'll use abandoned woodpecker holes, nest boxes, hollow posts, um, buckets, pipes, cans, and boxes of the appropriate size. Well, that's got to be pretty interesting to see. Both sexes inspect potential nesting cavities anywhere from 2 to 70 feet off the ground. Wow, that's a pretty, uh, that's a long difference, 2 to 70 feet. So the female does most, if not all, of the nest building while the male keeps her close in company. If the cavity is much deeper than 12 inches, she first backfills it with debris before building her nest in the back of the remaining space. She uses a wide variety of materials. Wow, this is, this is a lot of different things they can use. So they'll use grasses, leaves, twigs, stems, hair, fur, snail, seashells, feathers, bark, moss, cellophane, onion skin, paper, cloth, eggshells, and quite commonly, even shed snakeskin. Hmm, just about anything, huh? So the inner cup is usually 3 to 3.5 inches across and 1.5 to 2 inches deep. The female may continue to add fine materials like feathers to the nest during egg laying, incubation, and brooding. So the clutch size is usually 4 to 8 eggs and the incubation period is 13 to 15 days with the nestling period again 13 to 15 days the egg color is creamy white with pinkish buff splotched brown purple or lavender oh i bet that's really pretty <laughs> i've never seen one um, and of course the babies are born helpless sightless chicks naked and uh, soon to sport a grayish down so as far as conservation goes, um, the conservation concern is low for the great crested flycatcher. Populations have remained stable across their breeding range from 1966 to 2019. The North American Breeding Bird Survey Partners in Flight estimates the global breeding population is 8.8 .8 million and rates 8 out of 20 on the Continental Concern Score. So this is good. They're doing, they're doing pretty well. So that's a good thing. I like to see that. Local increases may be due to greater fragmentation of woodlands, which expands the edge habitats in their favor. So, you know, you have some birds that it takes habitat away and other birds that it tends to expand their habitat. So I guess in this case, it's good for the gray crested flycatcher. Local decreases may be due to the competition for nesting cavities like European starlings, tree swallows, house wrens, eastern bluebirds, or squirrels. Clean forestry practices have reduced the number of suitable natural cavities by removing dead snags and the like from forests. These flycatchers though are resilient and will nest in a wide variety of sizes and kinds of cavities in a wide variety of habitats. They do tolerate human presence. According to this, it keeps saying that they do tolerate human presence and are readily acceptable with hanging in nest boxes. Well, I have seen that, so that's okay. But like I said, I don't really feel like they like humans where I live. But, you know, nevertheless, let me know if your great, cri great crested flycatchers are friendly or if they're shy like mine. And let me know if you've seen one. This is a really, I don't know, this bird's really pretty and it's really cool to me. I like to watch it. I like their call. Um, really cool bird overall. So let me know what you think about the great crested flycatcher.